Photographer's Office. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're here today to talk about the future of aerial photography in Wisconsin, as you've already gathered by now. Um, before I get going, I just want to make some introductions here. Martin Roche with Geoplanning Services in Florida is the consultant helping out on the project. Martin, you want to say hi? Hello. <laughs> That's Martin. <laughs> Martin's going to be doing a lot of the presenting today, but I'm going to turn things to him in just a few minutes. Um, our session today is focused primarily on local governments. We've got other folks on the line, and that's okay. Everybody's welcome today. Um, before I get too far, too much further, I want to go over a few protocols for the meeting this morning. We do have quite a few people on the line, about 25 right now. So I do have everyone's sound muted. And it looks like everybody, or almost everybody, is connected via your computer. Um, if you do want to speak, if by chance you do have a microphone, let's say, on your computer, there is a little hand icon in the control panel uh, for the webinar software. If you want to speak, you need to raise your hand so I know that you do want to speak, and I'll go ahead and unmute your line. Otherwise, if you'd like to type in questions, right below that you should see a place you can type in questions. Um, feel free to type in questions at any point during the webinar. And we'll, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read those questions out so everyone can, can see those or hear those. And I'll also type a response, and we'll save those for later. So one or two methods you can use for feedback this afternoon or this morning, I should say. Um, we recognize that a webinar is in, you know, not the greatest for facilitating a discussion, but uh, we'll do our best in that regard. Um, any questions we get, are we're going to put on the FAQ we've got on the website, so just be aware of that. We're going to try to beef that up a little bit as we move forward. This actually is our second webinar of the week. We had another one yesterday. It seemed like it went OK. So hopefully we'll uh, repeat things again like that today as well. Just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about, hopefully. There we go. Um, so this is our agenda for today. Um, our, our main focus today is talk a lot about the survey results, which many of you, I'm sure, took. We actually had uh, close to 1,000 responses to that. We're going to talk quite a bit also about the regional meetings we had a few weeks back and some of our findings there and look for additional validation from you all to see if uh, what we heard matches what you think is ought to be the case moving forward. And as I said you know, a couple times now, please feel free to throw in any questions you have as we move along. And I'm waiting for the technology to keep up with me. Um, I think by now most of you have a pretty good sense what this project is all about. Martin, could you advance the slide, please? It's not working for sure. me. The slides are actually running from Martin's computer in Florida, so we're <laughs> doing this high tech. Um, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. In fact, um, I think a lot of you are somewhat familiar, if not very familiar, with this project. Um, really, the whole idea is quite simple behind the, the, uh, the project here. So um, as you as many of you know, the Wisconsin Regional Orthophoto Consortium most recently has been very successful. There's no doubt about that. And there's been lots of other examples of successful projects with regard to aerial imagery in the state for, for many, many years. years. Sewer packs another great example. They've been collecting imagery for 50 plus years. Um, but I think a lot of us would agree, I think many of you would agree, that moving forward, um, it's always prudent to take a step back and look at, well, what works, what perhaps doesn't work quite as well, and what changes or modifications or tweaks can we make to meet the widest possible range of needs that are out there. So that's really what this project is all about, looking at past projects, um, gathering input, gathering research, and developing a way forward. Um, formally, this project is to develop what would be called a business plan. I like to think of it as a blueprint, as many of you have heard me say repeatedly. Essentially, it's a step-by-step -step way, way forward for improving the current situation. Um, I look at this in both in terms of long-term and short-term needs. Short-term needs would be what short-term things can we propose that perhaps might enhance WROC in the future. I think it's somewhat a given that WROC will happen again in 2015. So what short-term um, things can we suggest to help move that effort forward? Longer term, 2020 and beyond. You know, I think the holy grail would be some kind of a statewide imagery program that's ongoing and sustainable. But what's it going to take to, to reach that goal? And that's, again, another long-term goal of this business plan is to outline those steps to achieve that vision. Um, the SCO, the State Cartographer's Office, we're the host for this project. Um, we kicked this off about a year ago, and the work's been happening intensively for about the last six months. This was facilitated by a federal grant we received from the FGDC. 
we are guided by a steering committee of your peers that are out there, quite a range of different folks from state agencies to county, RPCs, private and federal, as you can see on the screen. So these are all volunteers, and they've graciously volunteered to help us out. And it's been going, I think, it's been going great with their input so far. So we really appreciate their involvement. A little bit about the schedule. I mentioned the survey already. That's wrapped up just a few weeks back. We wrapped up the regional meetings also a couple weeks back. Right now, you know, this week we're doing these webinars to gather additional feedback. Um, we're also in the midst of conducting one-on-one -on -one or group interviews to gather information from folks, more free form that doesn't really, you know, isn't conducive to surveys and things like that. Just, you know, getting people's thoughts and feelings on how we should move forward. Next week, we're actually giving a presentation facilitating an hour-long discussion at the WLA Regional. And we're also doing more interviews during those two meetings, the WLA Regional and EWUG, that is. So Martin's going to be back up here in Wisconsin, and we'd like to sit down with as many folks as are willing to sit down and talk to us about what their, their needs and thoughts are. The goals are to have a draft plan available around about January 7th. That will be available for public comment. And based on those comments, the final, final product would be, again, around about uh, February 11th, just in time for the WLIA annual. And I want to emphasize something here that, you know, I think we all know this. You, know, you can put a plan on the shelf and there it sits, but that doesn't really do anybody any good, right? So we really want to, I want to really want to continue pushing this forward as, as we need to towards the future. I don't want this to be a plan that just simply sits on the shelf. Um, so in that regard, I'd like to talk just very briefly on a couple thoughts here about what makes this different from the myriad of <laughs> other reports that are out there. You know, what sets this project apart? Because I get this question a lot. Um, you know, one main difference that sets it apart, I think, is that we've got funding behind the project to develop the plan. Um, I've got a lot of skin in the game, so to speak, with this project. I've been putting a lot of my time into it. So in that sense, this isn't a volunteer effort like so many of our other efforts are. You know, this is part of my job currently to push this forward. And we've got Martin hired with those funds from FGDC to help facilitate the process. So that's a big difference. Um, the information gathering process has been more extensive and in-depth than a lot of efforts I'm familiar with. Certainly not all efforts that, as a geospatial community we've attacked, but a lot of the efforts that have been out there. So we've done a very deep job of gathering feedback from you all. Likewise, or similarly, I should say, the SCO, we've got an initiative in our strategic plan to develop a business case for a statewide aerial imagery program. And this project represents a big first step in addressing that goal. So we've got it in our strategic plan to, like I said, develop that business case for why this is important. So it's, again, just you know, part of what we're doing and part of what I'm doing you know, in, in amongst the other things I do for my job at the SCO. And moving forward, you know, I personally want to continue pushing this as I can, along with the rest of you, to achieve the goals that we all together lay out. This isn't about what I think is the way forward, but it's also certainly, obviously, about what you all think. So that's my, my two cents on how I think this project's a little bit different. Um, one of the last things I want to say before I turn it over to Martin was, what can you all do to help? And I think the biggest thing that you all can do to help is what you're doing right now, listening, giving feedback, and talking to us about what your needs are in the future. One specific thing we really need from you all are success stories. You know, what are you using imagery for? What are some cool applications you're doing? How are you saving resources? And, and tell us about that. We really need those sorts of success stories for the, the business plan to make this really have impact moving forward. So that's definitely something you all can do. I want to mention we've got all the information about the project on the website you see up on your screen right now. Jot that down. I think probably many of you have been to that website. But we've got documents. We're going to put all the presentations from these webinars up on the website and so on and so forth. So this is a great place to go to learn about the project and get access to all the project materials. So with that, Martin, I believe I'm going to turn it straight back to you. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Jim. Um, should we pause for a second to see if there's any questions? Um, sure, we can do that. OK. So again, if you guys have questions, you can, you can type them in. Otherwise, raise your hand. Looks like there's actually a couple of you now on the phone. Or if you do have a microphone on your speaker, or on your computer, excuse me, you can do it that way as well. Okay. So I'm not seeing any, Martin, so why don't you go ahead. All right, so we'll forge ahead then. Um, as, as Jim mentioned, we did have some tremendous response to the online survey, and I want to thank all of you for, for your participation in that. Uh, we had uh, almost 975 total responses, and you can see on your screen now kind of the breakdown of, of who responded. And we had a lot of, obviously, responses from government, uh, but a fair number from commercial and nonprofits as well. 
and the government distribution was was pretty widely uh, distributed between county and state uh, organizations, but fairly good representation from uh, municipalities, from the federal government as well as as um, as, as tribal governments. Um, a very large number of private firms also participated, uh, with 253 of them, and you can see that the majority of those were from survey and engineering firms. Although we did have some consultants, some geospatial service providers, and a couple of aerial imagery acquisition companies as well. Uh, and then finally, a lot of out of the nonprofits, 131 nonprofit uh, organizations that responded, 117 of those indicated they were in uh, universities or, or educational fields. Uh, you know, one of the things we were interested in finding out through the survey process was sort of is there a culture of, um, of cooperation within the aerial imagery user community um, in uh, in Wisconsin, we found out that you know very certainly there is. There's been a tremendous amount of participation in regional groups, either through the RPCs or the uh, WROC, WROC project, uh, but also with some state and federal and other initiatives as well. Um, so you know, it's very positive to see that there's been uh, really a, a tradition of, of cooperative imagery programs within the state. Uh, it's also interesting the number of folks who um, require imagery for more than just a single county or a single city, town, or village. Uh, we see here uh, on your screen now sort of the responses where we asked what geographic area do you require imagery of. And um, although obviously the majority or, or you know, the largest single response was for single county, um, we did have a number of folks who asked for statewide or for multi-county areas um, or for corridors. So we do see some, some need for folks to cross um, jurisdiction boundaries with, with their imagery. Um, interested to know whether or not the imagery that was currently available was meeting the needs of the user community within the state. And uh, you know, fortunately, uh, the majority, over 50% of the folks who responded to the survey indicated that yes, the imagery was currently meeting their needs. But we see 316 out of the 880 responses to this question that said the imagery is only partially meeting their needs. So um, you know, there obviously are some areas for, for improvement there. Um, then we have 20 folks who said the imagery did not meet their needs, and another 24 that said they really didn't have any idea if it met their needs. Um, so there's obviously some room for improvement in terms of the imagery and trying to meet uh, meet the needs throughout the user community. Um, because this is a, a business plan, one of the key elements of the business plan is obviously to look at making that business case. And part of that business case for an aerial imagery program is it surrounds both the cost of a program in terms of what folks are spending today um, and what the benefits might be for sort of a cost benefit analysis. Um, based solely on our survey responses, and we have gone through and, and cleaned up these data so they're not duplicate entries from any one uh, one institution, but over the last five years, survey respondents indicated that they've spent $11 million on imagery. Um, we asked what, what you've got coming up in the next in the next five years, and, and respondents indicated they're going to spend another $8 million or so over the next five years. So there's big numbers being spent um, on aerial imagery, on ortho imagery in particular within uh, within the state. Um, annual benefits that were reported, and I want to stress that these were reported benefits because these are from survey respondents again, uh, which is a very you know, potential small subset of the overall imagery user community. Uh, the reported benefits were, were over $5 million per year. So if you look at, at sort of the, you know, the five-year benefit versus the five-year cost on that area of imagery, um, you know, for every dollar that's spent on imagery, we're seeing a $2.42 return uh, in enhanced um, benefit to uh, to local governments, to county governments, to the state, as well as to the private sector. Um, again, just a sample there, um, and those benefits are probably significantly larger if we were to expand those to you know the entire community of aerial imagery users within the state. Uh, we also um, see that there there is um, some fairly significant money being spent on ob oblique imagery, um, with uh, uh, about two hundred thirty-three million dollars report or. $233,000 reported on an annual basis on, on that kind of imagery. And again, you know, with, with fairly significant benefits of, of better than a two to one return uh, for the oblique imagery uh, return on investment. So. Hey, Martin, can I say a word about the costs? Sure. I'll go back to that. Um, so, yeah, if you could back up, thank you. Yep. So when I first saw these numbers, you know, I was shocked. I, I frankly I couldn't even believe the numbers that I was seeing. And I spent a good part of the day on, uh, what day is today, Monday, just going through the spreadsheets that Martin sent me. And lo and behold, I, these numbers, I have a lot of confidence that they're accurate. I mean, $11 million spent over the last five years, I just, like I said, I, I couldn't believe it. 
But as you start to add up all the different folks out there that are spending money, and this goes way beyond you know counties purchasing or acquiring orthophotography, it goes beyond municipalities, state government. There's a lot of private entities out there, specifically small engineering firms, individual surveyors, that are out there acquiring imagery, probably more specifically purchasing imagery, um, spending money on this stuff out there. So it was just a little bit shocking. Like I've said three times, you can tell I'm shocked. I've said it three times. Um, so I think, that, again, these numbers, I have a quite a high degree of confidence that these are good numbers to go on. As Martin said, I mean, these are estimates. It's not a, you, you can only put so much stock into the, the survey responses and so forth. And we did ask for ranges on um, what people were spending. So there's lots of caveats here. But as far as a good number to shoot for and to be aware of, I think these are good. So sorry for the interruption. I just want to throw that out there. No, Martin. not a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And maybe some folks have some questions about that as well. So. Um, but you know, we didn't uh, invite you here today to you know to hear about um, sort of the, the big numbers that are being spent on imagery and, and the survey results. What we really invited you here today was to provide us with some additional input on sort of these fundamental questions that we need to have have um, input on um, in the development of the of the business plan. Uh, these are you know the same questions that were asked in the regional meetings, and what I'd like to do is um, I'll kind of summarize some of the key points that we that we received on these questions. Um, in our in our regional meetings, and offer you an opportunity to sort of add to those if there's something that you think uh, uh, was missed or is is critically important for us to us to know that is going on. Um, so in the in the regional meetings, one of the first questions we asked is, what are the business drivers for aerial imagery? You know, why do you need imagery? What of you know in terms of the function of your organization, your mission, your firm, is enhanced or driving your demand for aerial aerial imagery? Um, one of the key themes that came up sort of regularly throughout all of our of um, our workshops was that aerial imagery is really critical to improving the, the quality of the geospatial data uh, for the jurisdiction and the data that is ultimately used to help uh, make better decisions. Um, it also improves communications between citizens and elected officials um, and the staff because it's able to, you know you're able to use imagery to you know communicate a message, um, identify a location of a proposed project, for example. And really get a better understanding uh, of what's going on. Uh, some other areas that were business drivers for aerial imagery included uh, emergency response and planning, economic development, uh, just the whole notion of improving uh, customer service or service to citizens through having the imagery available. Uh, in no small measure, we heard repeatedly that citizens just expect that they can come in and get that, that aerial photography of their of their house, of their neighborhood, um, of the place where they're where they're deer hunting, and want to be able to. Uh, you know, get that from from the county or from the city office. Um, another business driver that was identified was um, aerial imagery helps um, to make service provision more effective and efficient. Um, through use of imagery, you can better manage your field work, better man manage permitting um, and a variety of different permitting programs, better manage code enforcement, long range planning, uh, better manage your assets, and then finally to really using the use aerial imagery for change detection and to confirm current conditions um, for tax appraisal for natural resource management and the like. Uh, wait for the slide to catch up. All right. So what we've got uh, going on over the next five years in terms of key initiatives um, is there is you know sort of broad sediment for um, a W Rock style project in, in 2015. Uh, there was some discussion about a buy-up on upcoming NAEP being possible for local governments to improve the uh, resolution or accuracy of those imagery, imagery that may be collected. Um, there are a number of cooperative programs planned for 2015. There's part of a, the notion of a, of a WROC or uh, with regional planning councils or with county governments. Uh, the DNR Forestry Department reported that they're going to fly half of the state and collect imagery over the next five years, 18-inch leaf on color IR. We had a number of counties and local programs um, that are in various states of planning for imagery projects over the next three to five years. And then the National Guard updates all of their properties on a, on a five-year cycle. Um, so Jim, do we want to see if we've got any sort of additions to those two questions, or should we just keep plowing ahead? Sorry, I was muted myself there. Um, Not a problem. Any, anybody have any questions you want to throw out there? All right, well, let's uh, continue okay. on, Martin. We'll continue plowing ahead then. 
Um, you know, obviously we had talked, you know, in terms of the in terms of dollar amount of benefits that uh, folks reported on the survey. We spent a good deal of time in in the regional workshops talking about benefits that organizations are seeing from having aerial imagery. And these benefits, maybe those tangible benefits, where you know people could say I saved X number of dollars, um, or was able to generate X dollars more in revenue. Uh, but a lot more of them, as would be expected, were sort of those intangible benefits, those things that we as as you know as public servants and as as members of government know um, we see, but it's very hard for us sometimes to put a dollar amount on. Um, you know, those included um, you know improved efficiency in customer service, reducing the the need for citizens to walk into an office to to file a permit application or identify a location. And to just generally meet citizens' expectations for having imagery available. Um, other benefits that were cited um, by a number of folks were just more efficient um, field work, uh, decrease in confusion when you send a, a crew out to do some sort of maintenance task on on a guardrail, to do you know uh, maintenance on a tree, whatever the case may be. The ability to provide an aerial image that identifies that location reduces the confusion and makes sure that the field work is actually done um, where it's supposed to be done. Also, uh, having imagery meant for more efficient inspections and examinations, um, particularly for tax appraisals and for rural um, agricultural department um, inspection sort of activities so they could understand best access to a piece of property uh, and what they were going to look for uh, prior, to, prior to actual arrival. Uh, improved communications with elected officials and citizens we mentioned already, but that was one that was identified pretty broadly as being an important use of imagery. Emergency uh, damage assessment post-event, um, if you have a bad storm um, and can quickly and accurately identify and um, assess the damages uh, from that activity. Some folks identified dispute resolution and avoidance as being another, another key, key use of imagery. And then finally, improved equity and property assessment, identifying those properties that are not appropriately assessed for, for taxes. Um, or identifying changes that have happened that may not have been permitted or may not have been caught on the tax rolls, you know, house expansion, sheds, construction, you know, in-ground pools, installations, those sorts of those sorts of activities. Uh, so we had you know a whole host of kind of um, uh, intangible benefits that we discussed during those meetings, and, and those are you know sort of the ones that we heard in, in a lot of cases. Uh, the imagery that's needed or required for folks, um, these are sort of the um, the high points of those discussions from the regional workshops. Generally, it was felt that in rural areas, you know, 12 inch pixel size um, or, or ground resolution was, was sufficient, but that urban areas frequently want six inches or better for a whole host of, of um, good sound business reasons. Generally speaking, people would prefer color leaf off imagery and you know, outstanding ground control and terrain models um, that are necessary to support the accuracy of the, of the um, high resolution imagery. You know, strongly felt that the collection schedule really should be driven in part by local changes. At a minimum, it should be every five years, but there may be those areas which need to be done more often because they're under experiencing um, you know, rapid growth or rapid change of some sort. Um, oblique was identified as being needed by many local government users, um, so that is another thing to, to consider as we move forward with um, trying to define what specific area imagery needs might be for the state. Uh, there are some sort of critical things that came up throughout the conversation um, on what needs to happen with imagery um, and an aerial imagery program for the, uh, for the state. Uh, and the first of those were that the program that really had to be predictable um, for multi-year budgeting and planning, that there had to be a sense of confidence that, that you know, if they said that, that, that it was going to be done in 2015 or 2020 or 2018, that local governments and county governments and potential participants in the program really had to have confidence that that was going to happen and that it wasn't just a uh, you know, a discussion phase that there was really, you know, a commitment to funding and a commitment to, to it actually happening. Uh, also, there needs to be an opportunity for buy-ups for higher resolution or derived products, much like there have been in those past cooperative work, um, programs that, um, you know, yeah, if, if there is to be a, a base product of, of say, 12 inch across across uh, the entire state, there needs to be an opportunity for cities and counties and, and other users of imagery to buy that resolution to a higher resolution or to get derived products from that, be it stereo pairs, be it elevation models, be it planimetrics, whatever the case may be. And then finally, that the collection has to be at least once every five years to be valuable uh, for, um, for the user community in the state. 
So with that, let's go ahead and pause again and see if um, anybody's got anything to add to sort of specific aerial imagery needs um, or benefits. I've been poking at people, Martin. Okay. <laughs> so if you guys have questions, speak up or type up at any point. If you've got questions or comments, you know, comments are fine too if you don't have a specific question. Um, like I said, I recognize this is not the best medium for getting feedback and having discussions, but we're certainly here to answer questions as well and take comments. All right. Otherwise, you just listen to us. Right, All right, exactly. keep going. All right, I know how boring that can be. So, all right, so you know we've identified you know through the survey that there are a number of people who are having uh, who the imagery that's available doesn't specifically meet their needs. And one of the questions we wanted to try to get to was why. What are the problems or obstacles that that have held folks back from getting imagery that's specific to meet their needs? Uh, one of which that you know is, is a shock to everybody, I'm sure, is that the budgets and the availability of funding to support that uh, was it was a critical problem. Um, you know, that's that's obviously true everywhere, particularly in this day and age where um, where money is hard to come by. Uh, but there was also identified a couple other critical um, critical obstacles um, that were sort of recurring again throughout the, the five regional workshops. One of which was that there was, seems to be a lack of management understanding of the value of imagery. Um, sort of this notion that uh, when you you know present a budget request, the response can occasionally be, well, you know, why do you need to spend all this money on imagery when I can just go to Google or Bing or some other online service and I can see you know imagery that's more recent than what you've got? Why don't we just use that? Um, it was also an identified problem with variable data access and sharing agreements from county to county and jurisdiction to jurisdiction, where some jurisdictions required a payment, some um, had you know the stuff available online for free to access and use, um, just that there was you know, issues with, with trying to piece together um, getting the data that might be necessary across a multiple county region uh, because the policies vary from county to county. Um, another problem that was identified was that with just the whole procurement project management and QAQC process. Since many folks you know, don't procure imagery on a regular basis, they may only procure it once every five years, uh, the technology changes the um, you know entire notion of being able to um, you know understand the changes in technology and what's necessary to manage an aerial imagery project and to perform adequate uh, quality control and quality assurance on those data um, can be difficult for jurisdictions that are not doing it all the time and for jurisdictions that have you know have a full workload already and to come in and say okay now on top of all the stuff that you're doing you know for your 40 50 60 hours a week already you also need to manage an aerial imagery acquisition project and then find somebody to do the quality control in-house. Hey, Martin, um, we've got a question. Martin, can we pause okay, for a second here? I absolutely so we've can. Got a yeah, so we've got a question about the timeline for deliverables. And this did come up repeatedly during the regional meetings where folks were generally not thrilled with the, I guess we'll call a lengthy timeline between the acquisition and the delivery. You know, mm -hmm. call it the March-April time frame for acquisition and oftentimes, let's say, December or so delivery for the final product. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a concern expressed for a lot of folks, specifically in the context of WROC. And we talked a lot at the regional meetings about, well, perhaps moving forward, the state should be broken up into different regions, you know, in some fashion, who knows how that might actually look, to, if you will, reduce the burden on the, the contractors so they can speed things out more quickly. Um, so we did talk a bit, we don't have any solutions to suggest specifically at this point, but that was a concern we heard a lot about. Um, so we certainly would like to hear feedback either now or later on what your thoughts are, if you agree or disagree with that, um, as far as the delivery timelines. Fred, I hope that answers your question or your comment. And we've got another question here, so hold the Okay. I want to read this before I start to... Um, do we ever contact Bing, Google, or other potential private partners to help fund a statewide program in exchange for the data? They must be paying someone for it now. So to answer the question directly, no. No one's had any conversations with Bing or Google or those companies. I can say from experience talking to folks in other states that those companies, generally there's no dial tone. They don't really talk to folks. Um, they definitely, I shouldn't say definitely, they rarely purchase data. Um, in the case of Bing, Microsoft, they are investing, along with Digital Globe, $100 million in acquiring imagery on their own, so they're not partnering with state and local folks. 
Um, I've heard rumors to the rumor mill that Google has purchased a fleet of planes and they're actually out there flying the stuff themselves. That's just rumors I've heard. Um, so unfortunately, to this point, those companies have not expressed a lot of in interest with partnerships. But mm -hmm. this question is valid. You know, is that something that could be pursued? It shouldn't be taken off the table. So I, I agree. Right, and and we will make an effort as part of this interview process to reach out to to contacts with those those private potential funders as well as other potential funders, um, you know, private sector funders uh, that may have an interest in statewide or large area data collects to judge whether or not there might be an opportunity to um, get them to help put the bill um, on, a, on a project like that. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move move through the uh, through the slides. So, there's some more information coming about some of that as well. Um, so, all right, Jim, any any other other questions? Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and continue for now? Okay, continue for now. So, some of the other problems that were identified um, were that there's inconsistent data across jurisdictions. If you need uh, you know data from multiple counties across a region or statewide, the data is inconsistent you know, quality and spatial resolution and the like. Um, a whole host of technical issues make it difficult for some folks to get the aerial imagery they need, including projections and formats and just storage and appropriate ground control. Um, so sort of to the, the question about um, uh, lag time in, in getting deliverables, we asked folks um, what's working well with the cooperative imagery programs that they've participated in already, and then what they haven't liked so much about some of those programs. And obviously the reason for that is, as we move forward, we're trying to make some recommendations in a business plan on how a statewide aerial imagery program might be structured and might look. We want to make sure that those things that are working well uh, can be either emulated or built upon in, in this new, new project. Um, and you know, also the stuff that isn't working so well with those projects, we want to make sure that we address those so we don't build a process or build a system that magnifies those kind of uh, less than desirable outcomes. So obviously what's working well is that there have been successful cooperative programs, Fly Dane, Sewer Pack, and W Rock, for example, um, have, have been successful and have a long history in some cases of being successful, you know, Sewer Pack for over 50 years, for example. Uh, what's also working well is the project buy-up options, the ability for folks to um, you know, get their needs met even if they're above and beyond what might be sort of the um, standard product that was part of that, that cooperative project. Uh, the ability to leverage funds from multiple partners, both local, state, federal, and, and private, have really been a benefit for these cooperative imagery programs. We want to make sure that we're able to continue to do that. Uh, making a standard product available statewide has been important to a number of users. Sort of the reduction in cost, the economies of scale that allow us to do you know, get more mapping or higher quality or um, for less money or the same money uh, has been a real benefit. And then just the whole notion that partnerships and relationships have been built, at least in part, on, you know, sort of these cooperative imagery programs that have, have generated, you know, benefit and result in other sort of uh, programmatic areas. So some stuff working well. What's not working well, um, a number of, of the workshops attendees identified the lack of leadership from the state or some other organization in trying to keep these cooperative and particularly cooperative statewide programs moving forward has been a problem. Um, communications really could be improved. There has been some duplication of mapping because of poor communications between between jurisdictions and between groups. And in some cases a lack of good communication has reduced potential cooperation and participation in uh, larger larger projects. Um, you, Jim and I met with, with uh, one particular city who I won't name who um, indicated that they were not aware that, for example, that there were buy-up options with WROC or that that was even going on, so they wound up flying a year later when they would have been perfectly happy to have you know, participated in a cooperative program uh, if they had known it was going on. Um, to the point that someone already brought up that the turnaround time from collection to delivery is too slow. It takes too long for me to get my finished product, um, and that obviously can create a problem and, and um, is less than optimal. One of the things that came up a couple of times was the, the entire notion of lack of accountability on a statewide statewide project. Um, lack of accountability meant a couple of different things, one of which is the relationship and communications with the specific vendor. Uh, may have been problematic where in the past if I was their, their lead customer because I was, you know, once I received the data and quality controlled it, I was sending them a payment. Um, you know, they were happy to, to talk to me whenever I, I had an issue or problem. 
and perhaps not so much when there was a statewide project underway, either in part because their customer base was broader than just me, or they just had so much going on on a statewide project that they just didn't have time to maintain those relationships. Um, and then sort of a broader problem um, that seemed to be recurrent was how hard it was to get commitments when there was an uncertainty in terms of the project likelihood and timing. I don't know when the project's going to be. I don't know how much the pricing, the cost of the project is going to be. I don't know when I'm going to get the data. Um, so there's a whole sense of sort of um, uh, uncertainty uh, with projects that lead to some um, issues and problems sometimes with getting funding and getting commitment. Um, other couple things in terms of that were identified that could be improved. One is that there could be better support for low resource counties, those counties that don't have the wherewithal to do stuff. Um, the fact there was no web services, so data had to be copied locally to be used. Um, and then sort of a recurring theme, and then we'll pause for some questions, is that historically in Wisconsin, imagery acquisition has been treated as a project rather than a program. Um, meaning there's not a consistent year-to-year -year activity. It's every five years we try to cobble together a group to get it done. So um, those are things that were identified as, as areas for potential improvement. And Jim, you've got some questions for me, I think. Uh, yeah, it's really more so actually a question for the other audience members. And the question okay, is, good. prior to WROC, what was the return time for projects? Meaning if, you know, before WROC existed, going back to 2005, everybody you know, did their own thing, so to speak. What kind of turnaround time were folks seeing? Um, if you are able to answer that, all of you, um, why don't you go ahead and type something in, uh, maybe the question window, the, the chat window, and I can just kind of read these off as they come in. Meaning, was it six months? Was it two months? Was it a year? What was it? I'm just curious to know. Six to 12 months mm -hmm. is one answer. Give people a chance to find the question in the chat window. Sure, sure. You know, since I'm not personally involved in the procurement of orthophotography, I can't really personally answer that question. You know, I've often just kind of through through friends and colleagues heard six months is a pretty common number, six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Another. What's your experience been working in private industry, Martin? Yeah, uh, six months is probably uh, reasonably standard, um, but. You know, certainly in some cases much faster depending upon the area. And actually, um, sort of as an aside, I was at the um, Geospatial Intelligence Conference last week, um, and uh, some of the technologies that were demonstrated there uh, using using drones and sort of remote field stations for data processing and, and image download suggest to me that it's not too much longer before we're going to see you know, turnaround time and measured in, in days and hours instead of weeks and months. Um, it's pretty pretty neat stuff going on in that market space. So yeah, so a couple more coming in seven to eight months. Um, a proposition or a suggestion that ninety days is perhaps an ideal. Uh -huh. I can say, for example, with the nationwide NAEP programs, which are you know those are very large firms running those programs. I believe it's sixty days after the end of the flying season they're required to deliver the NAEP data to FSA. Right. And they're turning that around. I shouldn't say nationwide. Basically, it's a third of the nation each year. Right. And you know they're shipping stuff off to India for processing, though, fortunately or unfortunately. So you can't make an apples right. to apples comparison there. But that is something that's out there happening. Right. Well, and and um, you know that may be you know as we move forward something that you know if there is going to be a statewide project in the future that there's some close attention paid to that requirement in terms of turnaround and deliverables and. Um, you know, that may mean that, that you know, a, a single small firm may not be appropriate to handle the, you know, the larger volume and may have to go look, look for partners or, you know, multiple providers to, to provide that, like they do with the NAEP, for example. So, um, all right, any other comments in terms of what could be improved? I'm just pausing for a second to let any questions flow in here. Right. Why don't you continue on, Martin? Okay. We'll forge ahead. So this is an area that we really do want to get, you know, some significant input from uh, from the folks on the line if we can. 
um, is sort of two two sort of fundamental questions that we you know would like to get as as broad an input as we can on. The first of those is you know, if we do have an area limited program statewide for Wisconsin, how can it be funded? Um, we had a couple of um, you know, of alternatives that were presented as potential funding uh, mechanisms during the regional workshops, uh, one of which was the land information program lapsed funds that, are, that, are, um, and that come out of land information um, fees into a land information program and are not, not spent directly in the land information program and are, are, are lapsed back to a larger state budget. Um, whether or not there is a tie to the 911 fees that might be used for mapping and spatial data. Uh, whether a special assessment was appropriate. Um, was there an opportunity to eliminate the sunset of the Social Security number redaction fees and apply those to on, an ongoing mapping program? Um, should there be support from the state? Should there be a, um, a line item in somebody's budget, the CIOs or the Division of Administration or, or some other organization that is specific to imagery? Um, or should there be a tax on imagery use you know, for state agencies. If a state agency is using imagery, then they are going to, you know, contribute to a fund to update that, that imagery, perhaps. Um, so, um, you know, are there some opportunities out there that are not on this list that we need to be uh, aggressively considering for, um, for funding? So we can pause for a second to see if anybody's got any, um, any questions or any comments or recommendations. So one thing I can throw in there while we wait for that, Martin, is um, we had a little bit of a discussion. The, the webinar yesterday was mostly state and federal folks, and there was a reaction, I guess, to the CIO budget line item, and Kurt Pulford, who you all, probably all of you know as the GIO, suggested that, yeah, putting money towards the CIO, since they're an IT service organization, maybe isn't the best thing to consider. Um, Kurt was suggesting, well, maybe there's money from DOA in some fashion, but don't limit it to CIO since they are an IT service group um, where Kurt sits. So that was a, a comment. Um, a few mm -hmm. folks, since they were state agencies on the line, you know, reacted to the comment about tax on imagery uh, for agencies. And I think a fair point came up that, you know, and I'm not going to get in the middle and agree or disagree, but the statement made was that some agencies are providing services that benefit other agencies, for example, or perhaps even benefit counties. You know, if they're maintaining a soils database um, to the benefit of other organizations, you know, should they be, if you will, quote unquote, tax for imagery? In other words, look at the whole picture holistically. Again, I'm not going to try to get in the middle, but that was just a comment that we did hear back from that group of folks. Um, one second here. Uh, I guess a comment here, not so much a question. If the state would distribute the imagery, they could have charges to the private sector. Yeah, that's a that's one approach, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, one second here, Martin. Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to read questions, interpret questions, and restate the questions. So I have to pause here. <laughs> um, did you pursue satellite imagery as opposed to conventional aerial photography? You know, we haven't gotten to that point, and we may not get to that point necessarily in the business plan, you know, to that level of detail. Um, certainly, I don't think commercial satellite imagery is down to the level of detail and accuracy yet. In fact, it's limited by the federal government, the, the detail and accuracy you can get. But, you know, for, for the lower resolution products, perhaps that is a viable option. It's not something we've actively pursued at this point, though. So that, that's a good question. We need to be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, okay. I anything else. Why don't, why don't you forge ahead here? Okay. All right. We'll go ahead, and if anybody has any other recommendations. So that's sort of, you know, related to that is if we have the money, how do we structure a cooperative area limited program? Uh, both organizationally um, and from a management perspective. And there were a couple of alternatives that were presented um, or discussed at least during our um, regional workshops. One of those was the notion of having state leadership uh, with city and county involvement and support uh, under that sort of model that, you know, the state leadership could be housed in an organization that could serve you know, all users throughout the state without a specific operational requirement that might drive program priorities. Uh, the notion there was, for example, um, if you put it in an agriculture or natural resources agency, agricultural and natural resource needs may 
because it is an that organization may drive the imagery program rather than the specific needs of all users throughout the throughout the state. Um, you know, another potential issue might be to have a state contract available for municipal and county and RPC use that um, you know would, would take care of the, all the procurement and and the like and um, you know, would uh, would be available for local government use as needed and upon demand. Um, sort of obvious, obvious or sort of implied, I guess, is that there's a need for some staff support. That this has to be, you know, to, to truly have an effective program, you need to have someone who's responsible for that program and who is involved intimately in the day-to-day -day activities thereof. And that you know, RPCs have had a role in the past, and that involvement should should continue um, moving forward. So couple ways to look at that, one of which might be a state leadership type structure with a user advisory board that sets standards. The state could fund the staff. The staff um, could then consolidate funding from the state and federal uh, to provide a base level of imagery, allowing the coordinator or that staff person to work with locals for their, their needs for buy-ups. Buy um, the state could then provide QAQC, image hosting and image-related cloud services to allow everybody to have access to those images uh, and those data as needed. Um, and this could, in fact, leverage some of the existing structure within the geospatial community in Wisconsin uh, to provide guidance and direction. A lot of existing communities out there um, that um, you know, might be able to provide some, um, some guidance and direction uh, to this sort of a, sort of a project. Um, another potential um, program that was or structure that was presented was a sort of the notion of a nonprofit organization that would have a board of directors that represented a broad user community. The existing committees and programs within the state could be leveraged to provide funding and, and help with program direction. Uh, one of the benefits perhaps of this was that contributions from private firms would be tax deductible um, if the nonprofit was structured properly. Uh, but there was some some question or some thoughts about whether or not that was sustainable over the long run. Um, from um, you know from from you know collection to collection over a long period of time, some other potential structures that were were talked about in in some of the sessions included whether or not the university or state cartographer's office might need to have have an involvement or might should be an appropriate person to have some involvement, and there were some identified advantages and disadvantages there that I'd kind of hope we can get some feedback on today if folks feel strongly one way or another about that. Um, there are some hybrid potential models as well between universe, with university and nonprofit participation or with state agency and nonprofit participation. So um, you know, Jim, let's see if we get any kind of um, uh, you know, comments or, or concerns or questions or recommendations in terms of, of, of um, programmatic structure. Sure. Um, nothing at the moment. You know, I will okay. restate what I mentioned earlier, and that is, you know, this is not the end of your opportunity for feedback. I believe everybody in the line knows where to find me. I've received probably a dozen email messages on, from me on this subject over the last few months. Um, so anytime you can reach out to me personally, reach out to Martin. We'll have some contact info at the end here. And if you just want to talk, you know, specifically, for example, next week at WLA or EWAG, just sit down with us for even 10 or 15 minutes and just give us your thoughts. That's uh, that's perfectly okay as well. Yep, we will be there um, for the whole whole time. Right. Uh, I do have a question here. Will the presentation slides be available for future reference on the website? Uh, yes, is the short answer. I'm actually recording the webinar today as well, so I'll be putting that up on the website probably at the end of the week after I do a little bit of cleanup on it. So all this stuff will be available. Uh, will be available on the website. Yes, okay. definitely. Uh, right. Not seeing anything else. Why don't you go ahead and continue? All right. Oh yeah. Sort of. <laughs> Your questions. There we go. Your questions. Right. Do does anybody have any any questions? Um, well, let me do this part. Yeah. I'm just looking back at the questions from yesterday. Um, this wasn't a question, but it was a comment. Maybe folks will agree or, or disagree. Um, but one person proposed, as a taxpayer, I disagree with using 911 fees or eliminating the, eliminating the sunset of the SS Social Security number redaction fees. Public costs should correlate to public usage. So this person was essentially making a statement that you know don't use 911 or the Social Security redaction fees for anything but those. And I mention that up because 
um, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently of of that. So that's just a comment, just for to throw that out there. Okay. An important one because I, I, you know, suspect there's more than one person who feels that way. All right. Any other questions coming in that you can get help? Yeah, and a response to that is that 911 uses imagery, uses and relies on imagery, which is a fair statement. Sure. I think, um, at least from some sort of my perspective, there is sort of a rational nexus or a rational tie between, you know, maintenance of a, a 911, particularly an E911 program, and the ability to have good imagery and good geospatial data. Uh, that that one. Is you know, I think that you can you can make an argument or a case that they're they're related. Uh, that may be a bit more of a stretch in terms of the social security number redaction fees, obviously. <laughs> but um, but certainly nine one one is is a, is a big user of imagery. So, right. I'm just scanning down to see what other comments we might have. Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we just go ahead and move on to the the next steps here, and I'll take this one. Okay. So as I indicated earlier on, we're going to continue next week with the interviews and beyond that as well, um, opportunity for folks to sit down with us. We can do this in person next week or via phone at some point in the next uh, three to four weeks. Um, we do need to start wrapping up so we can get on to the actual construction of the business plan. Um, as Martin mentioned, we did get almost 1,000 responses to the, to the uh, survey. Excuse me. So it's going to take us a fair bit of time to sort through all that stuff. We've got a lot of great data, but it is going to take some time. Um, some of you on the line, and certainly a large number of your colleagues, had offered to share success stories on the survey. So that's something we need to be getting back to folks about that and collecting up those brief stories, like I mentioned earlier on. Um, so a lot of analysis of the information we gathered from you all over the last couple of months will be happening during the months of November and December, uh, going into the draft plan in January. And I indicated earlier that is the plan for getting it out there. So that is the, are the immediate next steps, I believe. Here's our contact information. We're about five minutes left. So getting done early is an OK thing. Does anybody have any last comments, questions, thoughts you'd like to share with the group? Uh, OK, here's a question. Would this report compare and contrast Wisconsin, the Wisconsin situation? Um, with other states. Yes, I think we need to do a fair bit of that. You know, we can't make it too comprehensive, but certainly, for example, Minnesota right now is in the process of doing essentially the same thing we are. They're doing an aerial imagery business plan. I definitely want to compare notes with Minnesota and other surrounding states just to see you know, what they're coming up with. And there have been a number of other states, probably I would say half dozen or so, have gone through this exercise. We've, of course, looked at all those reports and will continue to do so. You know, every state's unique, however, and every state has a different situation. So we're going to have to, you know, take that into account. But to answer the question, yes, that's part of this process. And you know, sort of in addition to that, part of the process will be to look at um, some other states and how they are, are funding their uh, statewide imagery programs to see what might might have value for the situation in in Wisconsin. Um, so maybe not a direct sort of compare and contrast the overall situation, but identification of some models that have been successful elsewhere and how uh, they could potentially fit within the uh, uh, within the Wisconsin structure. And there's another question here, which actually is quite similar. Do you have applicable examples of other states funding their statewide programs that might work here? You know, see last answer. I think that's part of it as well as looking at what works in other states. Again, same models as you just stated, Martin, may not necessarily work here, but we can certainly get some ideas. So that's a great comment. Mm -hmm. Sure. OK, um, I think we are going to wrap things up here, Martin. So again, if anybody has any comments, questions, feedback after the fact, feel free to get back to us anytime. Uh, Martin, did you have any closing comments? No, no, just you know, don't hesitate to either visit with us over you know next week or to email or call at any time if, if there are some you know if you have some questions or have some additional uh, information you think it's important for us to know. Um, we're you know delighted to hear that, and um, you know we'll take those comments any way we can get them. Okay, well we're going to call it good there then, everyone. Thanks for your time this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Hope to talk to you again soon. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon.